Good evening, Prescott Valley. Welcome to the January 9th, 2018th Parks and Recreation Commission meeting. <coughs> Kathy, uh, can we have a roll call, please? <coughs> Chairperson Freyer. Here. Vice Chairperson Avalos. Present. Commissioner Brinkman. Here. And Commissioner Gummer. Yes. Thank you. Moving on, a uh, slight modification to the agenda for our guests to move item 9A up to below 5C. So it would be just after the announcements and the extravaganza. Um, if everybody will mark their agenda to represent that um, I'll, and it's approved, uh, we'll do so. Can I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the modification of item 9. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the motion passes. The agenda is approved. Um, approval of minutes from our November 14th, 2017 work study. If everybody's had a chance to review those, offer any suggestions for changes. If not, I'll take a motion to approve the work study minute meetings. I'll make a motion to approve November 14th work study meeting minutes. And a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And same thing for our November 14th, 2017 regular meeting minutes. Any, any changes, please offer up. If not, I'll take a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve the November 14th, 2017 regular meeting minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And those pass as well. Okay, moving on to our announcements. Start with uh, Director Witte and update on athletics. Good evening, commissioners, and happy new year to each of you. <clears throat> We're going to get to, uh, started tonight with a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we have information related to athletics. We're going to begin with our men's three-on-three -three basketball spring leagues. Games will start Thursday, March 2nd, uh, with an enrollment cost of $150 per team. This covers seven games in a single elimination tournament. Uh, location of play is scheduled for Glassford Hill Middle School. Uh, start time of 6.45 each evening. We will have two divisions, men's A and B. Uh, we will have a maximum of six teams per division. Registration opens on February 1st, and you can do so online at pvaz.net. Next, we have our spring volleyball uh, co-ed and women's leagues. Uh, we actually started uh, play tonight uh, with our fall season. We'll be going into our spring season here. Uh, that will start February 1 and run through March 2nd. Uh, again, our costs are $150 per team. This is for co-ed A, B, women's A, B. Uh, Tuesdays will host co-ed. Wednesdays will host women's. Uh, the game's beginning the week of March 20th, uh, with game time starting at 6.30 p.m. Again, these will also be held at the Glassford Hill Middle School Gymnasium. Registration can be done online at pvaz.net, or you can give us a call at the office at 759-3090. Uh, on the 2018 spring softball season, we're looking for men's and co-ed's team, co-ed's uh, D1, 2, and 3, men's D1, 2, and 3. These will play on Sundays with times between noon and 7 p.m., with no games on Easter weekend, which is April 1st. Registration opens January 15th, continues through February 18th. It uh, is a $270 per team registration fee that will include seven regular season games, one tournament for the top four in each division. A man mandatory manager's meeting is scheduled for March 1st at 7 p.m. in room 331 of the Prescott Valley Civic Center. All games will be played at Mountain Valley Park at our fourplex there. We have a maximum of eight teams per division. Again, register at pvaz.net or give us a buzz at the office, 759-3090, asking for Ms. Brianna Hetzel, our program manager. In addition to this, some of our upcoming classes that we have, uh, new to our menu is the, and pardon the pun on that, our traditional ways cooking workshop. Uh, this is bread and butter making in the old fashioned way and the pictures are very exact. You will learn how to churn butter during this class. This will be held Saturday, January 13th from 10 a.m. until noon in room 331 of the Prescott Valley Civic Center. Ages 12 and up are eligible with a cost of $25. 
for adults and 15 for anyone between the ages of 12 and 17 with a prepaid adult. Uh, Pre-registration is required, so please visit us on our website at pbaz.net. Also, Adult Zuma is back starting January 18th on Thursday nights from 6.45 to 7.45 with our instructor, Miss Natasha Wright. Come join the fun of the latest crazed dance fitness trend. Uh, ages 12 and up are available. Again, as I mentioned, Thursday evening starting at 645, third floor activity room of the Prescott Valley Civic Center. Cost is $3 per individual class. Uh, this is a drop-in class and pre-registration is not required, uh, but register, participants may register or pay at the time of class. Give us a buzz at 759-3090 to do such, and we look forward to seeing you there. In addition to that, our rejuvenation yoga is held on Saturdays. This is a all levels yoga class. Uh, location of this will be held in our activity room, again on the third floor of the Prescott Valley Civic Center. This is Saturday mornings at 8 a.m. until 9. The cost is $6 per class and is eligible for ages 12 and up. There are limited yoga mats available, but we do encourage you to bring your own. Again, give us a call at the office or visit us on the web for registration if you see fit, uh, but this, it, you can drop in for this class as well. In addition to that, our last slide this evening of announcements for activities is our Be a Better Basketball Player. Uh, this is with Coach Roy Jenkins. Uh, the activities are held at the Canyon View uh, Middle School Gymnasium right off of uh, Florentine. These are held on Saturdays. Uh, time from 1 to 3 p.m. This is a, a open and available to boys and girls ages 8 to 14 with a cost of $20 per session. Per session. Uh, please feel free to give us a buzz at 759-3090. Pre-registration is required and can be done at our website at pvaz.net. With that, that uh, concludes our announcements. Uh, our next item uh, for you this evening uh, comes from the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I know, commissioners, you are very familiar with our fisheries program that is held out at Fane Park. Uh, the gentlemen speaking to you tonight uh, are in charge of that program, uh, both from a regional and state process. Uh, they are coming to speak with you concerning a presentation that will be made to council in regards to a expanded agreement. Uh, they're going to give you a little bit more details into where we're at, what we're doing. My apologies, gentlemen, for not starting your system <laughs> correctly in doing such. But tonight we have with us uh, Mr. Matt Shamel. He is our community fishing manager, as well as his supervisor, Ms. Mr. Scott Gerton. So, Scott. Thank you. And just uh, for the record, I uh, manage the uh, community fishing program, but I'm, I'm not Matt's supervisor. Uh, he's, he's far smarter than me. Uh, but uh, Matt is here as uh, support for questions that may come up for, you know, uh, fisheries from a regional perspective, that sort of thing, uh, as well as, you know, things that I might not be able to answer. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to come here and talk to you today about a proposal that we hope uh, the city of Prescott Valley uh, would be willing to consider uh, as a partnership with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, uh, back in July of this year, uh, Matt and myself uh, met with uh, city manager uh, Tarkowski, I, okay, and uh, Deputy Manager Ryan Judy to discuss this proposal, and uh, we presented that to them. Uh, they seemed to be quite receptive to that, uh, but also noted that uh, this should go in front of the commission uh, for consideration as well. So uh, no big surprise, obviously, the department has a vested interest in uh, the fishing at Fane Lake and also to improve the fishing uh, within the, the communities. Um, the timing of this proposal is particularly good because the program that I'm working in is uh, expanding, uh, and we've been expanding for several years, and we're going to continue to expand uh, into new communities. So we hope uh, that Prescott Valley might be willing to uh, become a part of this program. 
So in essence, what we sorted, uh, and I'll get into the details uh, throughout this presentation, and uh, if anyone has questions, uh, please feel free to just, you know, holler and, and uh, I'll do my best to, to answer. So um, what we sort of envisioned is uh, development of a partnership that at least initially would be a commitment to improve and expand upon the fishing opportunities here in Prescott Valley, not just in Fane Lake, but also our hope is to uh, roll in the lakes at Urban Forest. I'm not exactly sure what they're called because if you look on Google Maps, it's called Yavapai Lakes, and then I've heard the term urban forest used, so I'm not exactly sure uh, what the term is, but uh, so uh, I may use it interchangeably here uh, throughout the presentation. And then uh, secondly, uh, if this, we believe that this initial commitment could hopefully open some doors to, you know, to broaden uh, partnerships, to expand upon uh, more things, uh, because we obviously know there's been um, lots of maintenance on the dam at Fane Lake. There's a need to control aquatic vegetation periodically, uh, lots of maintenance uh, that goes into that. If we have, you know, formal uh, committed partnerships, I think that makes it easier from our standpoint to actually uh, either directly help through providing uh, engineering support, or in some cases, we might even be able to provide money uh, to the town uh, to help do those things. Um, and also, um, you know, sort of big pie in the sky is we could even discuss other uh, opportunities where we might be able to, you know, promote other activities um, that occur in or around the Prescott Valley area that we're interested in, you know, things like shooting sports, um, you know, hunting, uh, that sort of thing. But that, you know, that's kind of, you know, down the road. So first off, I tell you, uh, I just wanted to talk to you about the community program so you're familiar with what it is, what we're trying to do with it, and, and where we're trying to go. And then I'll get into the details, the nitty gritty of the proposal uh, a little bit later on. So just to give you, you know, some background, the community program has been around uh, for quite some time. Uh, it actually started in 1983 as kind of a pilot project for a couple of years, so the formal year of its uh, start was 1985. The department recognized back then that obviously most of the growth or most of the population resided in urban areas and that most of the new growth was occurring within uh, cities and towns. So we saw an opportunity to partner uh, with various communities and make use of these uh, ponds and lakes that were already in the parks. Um, we recognize that people don't always have, you know, not all people have the means and ability to go up to the rim country or the White Mountains to go fishing. So this was particularly important for a large segment uh, of the folks that live in urban areas. And so we wanted to focus on, you know, close to home fishing opportunities, a place that, you know, families can go, kids can get out of school, ride their bikes down to the parks, that sort of thing. Um, so hence uh, the beginning of the program. Uh, initially, it actually wasn't called the Community Fishing Program, it was called the Urban Fishing Program. Uh, the very first waters, uh, you know, were in the uh, Phoenix area as well as Tucson. And then we <clears throat> gradually grew the program uh, through the years. Uh, and actually Matt uh, worked in the program at one time too. So. He's, th yeah, 13 years ago, yeah. So by 2013, we had the program uh, in place at 21 waters in 11 different communities. And at that time, the department was considering a, a, a complete overhaul of its license structure. And we took the opportunity at that time to completely overhaul the program and rebrand it as well from an urban fishing program to a community fishing program, reflecting the fact that it is our intention and desire to, you know, move outward into other communities uh, as well. And we've been doing that um, pretty aggressively. So uh, in 2014, we expanded to 15 uh, new sites. Uh, 2016, we added a couple more. 2017, we added a couple more. So we just keep, you know, uh, adding about two per year has is, is been our average. So where it stands right now is we've got actual former formal partnerships with 19 different communities uh, if, with 41 different waters 
And as I mentioned, we just added some waters in Sholo and in Mesa. We've, we've got a lot of interest out there. I've had uh, contact with city leaders in uh, many communities, including uh, the list that you see there, Peoria, Queen Creek, Glendale. All of these places either have plans for or are in the design phase or are actually physically starting to dig ponds for the explicit purpose of providing uh, you know, fishing opportunity in those communities. And obviously there's potential new additions with existing waters in a variety of communities and hopefully with, you know, Prescott Valley kind of falls into that, that list right there. So in 2015, we developed a vision uh, to the program to ensure that anglers in all incorporated communities uh, have an opportunity to go fishing close to home. Um, by 2025, uh, our core goal is by 2025, we want to grow the program to accommodate uh, 200,000 anglers uh, in 36 of the 91 incorporated communities. We've since really dropped that incorporated communities. If we've got partners that are willing to work with us, whether it's a municipality or a private entity or something like that, we're willing to go there too. So we kind of dropped that, you know, the, the incorporated uh, part of that. Right now, um, we, we're about halfway there. We've got about 100,000 dedicated anglers uh, in the program, so we've got a ways to go. Uh, the motto of the program is, has been and continues to be that if the, fish, uh, if the people can't get to the fish, we'll bring the fish to the people. So here's just a slide showing uh, where or how the you know, program has sort of grown. Uh, at least the last few years here from 21 waters to 41 waters from 11 communities to 19 communities uh, We've got waters now. We're literally spread out completely across the state. We've got waters all the way down uh, in the Yuma and um, uh, so, uh, The southwestern part of the state all the way over to uh, Somerton is that uh, town I was thinking of and then all the way over to the eastern part of the state with uh, St. John's, uh, all the way north to Ash Fork, community of Ash Fork, and all the way south to Tucson. Uh, so we're spread out. Um, so one of the questions that comes up often is why, why are we sort of pushing partnerships with this program? And there's several answers to that, one of which is the department doesn't have any warm water uh, fish hatchery production capacity right now. All of the catfish, uh, bass, uh, crappie, uh, sunfish that we stock has to come from other vendors and we buy those from out of state and that requires, you know, a considerable amount of money. Likewise, uh, all of our hatcheries, we've got six uh, state uh, facilities uh, that are all focused uh, primarily on trout. And our production is really maxed out, and we can't even meet the demand that's out there. Um, we have to supplement our existing in-state hatchery production with purchasing uh, of fish from vendors. That also requires money. Um, we believe, you know, just conceptually that the fishing uh, just complements the other activities that parks and recreation departments are already doing, you know, out there. So this just sort of adds a bit of flavor to the things that are going on out there. And just a side note, the department is, is self-funded. We don't receive any general fund revenue from the state legislature. We get our revenue uh, from the sale of licenses, uh, and I'll get a, I got another slide into that. But um, the bottom line is we can go a lot further if we have formal partnerships with communities. Uh, one of the big things under a partnership is that uh, we will actually, you know, make these formal commitments to um, stock on a regular basis rather than stock sort of as money is available because that's kind of how it is right now. It's just if there's money out there and we can, you know, throw it at, uh, you know, some of the regional waters, that's what we do. But in the community fishing program, we, we make that formalized so that we are going to stock, you know, X number of times, we're gonna do our best to you know, stock X number of times uh, per year. So that's a big difference uh, with uh, a lot of the other waters. And uh, lastly, that studies have just shown that you know, there's a greater chance of long-term success uh, if there's uh, commitments by a couple of parties um, in, towards achieving a common goal. And as a testament to that, we've got you know, several of these communities that have been have started in the program and they're still with us 33 years later. So the, the communities really value it. 
and the people that you know go fishing in there. Some of the uh, basic facts, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we're spending over $1.1 million a year right now just in our community program um, buying catfish, trout, and bluegill, uh, pretty close to 300,000 pounds a year. Uh, we're doing pretty close to 600 individual stockings per year. By comparison, we've got an entire hatchery program, as I mentioned, six facilities, um, and uh, we're, we're pretty close in the number of stockings that we do on an annual basis. Uh, the community program is paid for by fishing licenses, obviously. Uh, people are required to go out and get a license. Uh, the partnership fees that I just mentioned, uh, we get some money um, through Sportfish Federal Aid, which uh, also referred to as Dingle Johnson uh, monies. It's uh, been a longstanding federal program. There's an excise tax on fishing tackle, uh, motorboat fuels, I think electric motors and a few other things, and that's reapportioned to the states on a uh, formulary or formula so that uh, all those states can, can partner up and pony up some of their license dollars to get some of those um, federal dollars. And lastly, uh, we've got some wildlife conservation funds. Uh, those are funds that were passed by voters under Proposition 202. Uh, it's basically some shared revenue from the gaming uh, compacts back then. So just uh, this is a visual representation. When we say uh, develop close to home opportunities, if you draw a five mile radius around all of our lakes, because um, that's based on our creel surveys, that's kind of about the median distance people will travel to go to you know, a quote close to home opportunity. This is what the city of Phoenix uh, or the Phoenix metro area looks like right now. So we've got pretty good coverage uh, throughout the metro. Uh, we've got similar, you know, radiuses around uh, Tucson and Yuma. Uh, and now, as I mentioned, we're growing into more of these rural communities, St. John's, Ash Fork, Sholo. Payson's actually been a partner with us, I think, since the late 90s. Um, so if you look at that sort of concept to the you know put a five mile radius around the two waters that we're proposing fane is kind of hard to see it's uh just this little green spot here so it extends over into prescott uh, this is uh willow uh, springs and watson here uh and then of course uh, the yavapai lakes right there uh, so uh, there's some pretty darn good coverage you know throughout the, the community here so typically when we're approaching a community, some of the things that we hope to, these aren't you know, deal breakers, but we look for places that are obviously open to the public. Uh, we look for partners that are willing uh, to, or we look for areas where there's you know, a willing partner, uh, whether that be a city, county, you know, private entity. Um, Good quality water um, is uh, important, and uh, my understanding is the Yavapai Lakes are grade A uh, effluent, and that's reclaimed water. Uh, that's that's fine. And how's the, just to interrupt real quick, the effluent is, are the fish safe to eat coming out of that grade of yes. effluent? Okay. Yes, yeah. According to Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, they've set standards, and that is an allowable standard for fish consumption and partial body contact. They've got a whole list of, you know, different uses and, and uh, for those types of waters. But, yes, that would suffice. stores <laughs> so uh, you know we also look for you know if there's uh, public facilities restrooms parking lots those types of things access uh, to the edge of the lake so that we can get our stocking equipment down to the lake uh, and obviously shoreline access uh, by anglers uh, the beautiful thing is you've got all that it's already in place at both sites so it's like a perfect you know perfect fit uh, in terms of just basic criteria. So a little bit more just on the fish stocking. We primarily focus on three main species, catfish pretty much during the warm months, summer months, uh, trout during the winter months. We do a uh, limited amount of stocking of bluegill, uh, both for uh, obviously people to catch, but also that serves as a forage base uh, for the, the fisheries. Uh, we used to do more bass stocking. We haven't stopped it completely, but it is 
you know, fairly cost prohibitive. So I kept it on the list and sort of crossed it out there just to reflect that um, we can get them, um, but they because of the costs, uh, its stocking is pretty limited. Um, the amount we stock is pretty much based on uh, the size of the lake and also the sort of strategy that we're trying to achieve. You know, catfish, we typically stock anywhere from uh, 80 to 100 uh, pounds an acre. Sometimes we'll go, you know, higher than that. Um, and those are about 15 to 20 inches, what we call a catchable size uh, fish. Um, they average about a pound and a half a piece. Uh, our trout that we get from our vendors uh, average about, uh, we stock those at about 30 to 35 on average. Sometimes we'll take that up to 70 pounds an acre or even higher in some cases. Uh, so yeah. one thing about that, currently the fish that we're stocking in Fane Lake, which would continue to go in, are more like about a third of a pound, not okay. three quarters of a pound. So the, the size trout yeah. that the community program buys is quite a bit larger than the ones that are hatcheries are producing. It's great to hear. Hmm. Yep, that's an excellent point. And uh, I've got another slide here uh, in the details of the proposal that sort of uh, address some of that. And then sunfish, uh, you know, same type of thing. We stock uh, usually catchable size, you know, sunfish. Um, the program sort of uh, is focused around two different what we call primary strategies, sort of what we call our core waters, which is Pretty intensive stocking. It's about every two weeks. Um, catfish uh, during, again, the warm months. Uh, trout during the uh, cooler winter months. Typically, we don't stock during the hottest months of the summer. We, you know, cut it off in about mid-June, July, August. The, the surface temperatures are just too hot, and it's just too hard for those fish to make the, the jaunt across country. Um, all of the fish that we've been adding to the program up to this point have fallen under what we call our expansion water strategies, which is a less intensive stocking uh, that, you know, we believe will uh, accommodate, um, you know, not quite as much uh, pressure, but yet still provide quality fishing in the community. So uh, same type of strategy there, just less stockings. We do uh, nine per year as opposed to 21 per year. And then obviously, depending on the community, depending on the location, we've got a variety of different things we're trying in new areas. We've got uh, trout only, what we call a trout only management strategy in Payson. We've had that going since the late 90s. We recently added a uh, stone dam to our program a couple years ago. That's only catfish. That's all we stock in there. Doesn't get a lot of pressure, so we only stock it a couple times a year. Uh, and that helps keep the costs limited too, because that's actually a partnership we have um, with a, a private entity up there. And, uh, and then we've got uh, sort of, since we're starting to add or consider adding more waters in upper elevations, we're sort of working on this strategy, and this would probably be one that uh, Fane uh, and um, uh, Yavapai Lakes would, would fall under, would be um, stocking uh, these large vendor provided rainbow trout um, at least four times a year, and then catfish at least four times. Uh, and we probably do those, you know, catfish into the summer months when we see stocking uh, in, in the, you know, in those other waters, in the Phoenix area waters. Uh, and then um, probably one um, sunfish stocking in Yavapai Lakes in the spring. And I'll get into, again, the details uh, for uh, the proposal. So actually that's, Perfect transition. So currently, Fane is what we sort of refer to as a state-managed uh, fishery we, that receives, as Matt mentioned, um, stockings of rainbow trout from our Page Springs hatchery and only periodic stockings of catfish. On average, that's been um, maybe one to two stockings per year, averaging about 500 pounds, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, obviously, the Yavapai Lakes, uh, they're not utilized as a, a fishery right now, so those aren't, you know, stocked at all. Well, although we've seen fish in there, uh, we've seen some, some koi and probably, you know, releases pets, you know, people that... Would, uh, yeah. would there be mitigation of those species before you stocked? I, we may, we'd probably go in and do a survey. Um, there might be some value in, you know, just doing a little bit of background information to kind of see maybe what's in there just so that there isn't any yeah. uh, complete surprises might be worth going out and you know getting some idea what the basin looks like too so uh yeah you know but we, we 
probably wouldn't renovate it. And okay. Yeah, I was just curious if, if there was a clash between trout and koi or something now. Or yeah, somebody fish released their water monster or something. Up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we sort of envision is, is under a partnership to improve and expand upon the fishing opportunities in Prescott Valley. Uh, for rainbow trout, uh, what we're proposing is uh, we would continue those stockings as Matt mentioned, uh, for, for uh, the rainbow trout from Page Springs Hatchery. On average, that's been about 14 stockings per year. Uh, I pulled the data for the last 20 years and you know we're just under about 5,000 pounds, so we would continue to do that. Um, we would also throw in at least four of those stockings per year of those larger trout, those 10 to 13 inch vendor provided trout. Um, per year, and we would do that at both Fane and Yavapai Lakes. Um, and and so Yavapai would only receive those larger rainbows uh, from the vendors, um, so we would just keep those Page Springs trout going to Fane. On the catfish side, uh, Fane would get um, four stockings, but what we're proposing to do is uh, put one of those uh, to be sort of the first one of the year, probably would be a double stocking. Um, and it'd be pretty intense at about 320 acres or pounds per acre, which is, that's a lot of fish. Yeah. Um, based on the, you know, historic data, that's about 325% more fish than, than what is catfish than what is going in there right now. So that's a, that's a big jump. And then the Yavapai Lakes would uh, get four stockings of catfish per year. One of the things when we met with uh, Larry, uh, uh, City Manager Larry and Deputy Manager Judy is that uh, they just they really wanted more fish. You know that was the that was the big thing. So we think that uh, this does that. This is just sort of another representation of what that probably would look like. You know on a on a per month basis. So the rainbow trout from uh, for Fane is on this left left column here. We we're still going to do those, and then we would add these these other stockings here of, of trout, four per year in both Fane and Yavapai, and then our catfish stockings. Again, that first one of the year, right there, would be a doozy. That would be a lot of fish going in just to kind of get the uh, catfish, you know, season uh, kick started. So. Um, some of the benefits of this is, as I mentioned before, uh, we would guarantee these stockings as opposed to just periodic as when money's available. Uh, here's another big benefit is that you would have two locations within Prescott Valley uh, to fish so that if there happens to be an issue with one of the lakes, you know, a fish kill or maybe the, you know, there's a need to, to you know, take Fane down for a little bit to do some critical maintenance, there would still be a place within the community for people to shift uh, their their angling pressure and still be a place to go, so they wouldn't be, you know, shut out. Um, and uh, so that's a, a a big benefit. More fish. Um, there'd be more trout, larger trout, and a big increase in the number of catfish. Um, and it's just. In essence, you know, providing the community with what we believe is just a, a, an enhancement to quality of life. It's just uh, something else out there that families can enjoy uh, outdoors. So the big question is, what is all this going to cost? And so generally, we've been sort of formulating our partnerships uh, based on what we're asking for is a 25% of the total cost of just the fish. And so under this proposal, I've got like rainbow trout from Page Springs. Um, that's about our estimate of what that costs. Um, that's not even included in this because we're gonna continue to do that. So all of these new costs would be the trout from the private vendors, the catfish from the uh, vendors that we use, the sunfish. And so that'd be an additional $24,000 worth of fish. And the cost to Prescott Valley on an annual basis would be 6,000 for both those sites. That's, um, and with that, there'd be, you know, pretty close to $50,000 worth of fish, you know, going into the two sites there. So we're pretty confident that's gonna keep the, you know, community happy. And so j just to be clear, like Scott said, the fish we're already putting in, we're already planning on putting in, we're gonna continue that's not part of the 25% at all. 
25 percent okay. is only of the additional, so you'd be getting the other 75 percent new fish. Oh, that's yep. So uh, we typically do these uh, intergovernmental agreements uh, between the you know partners in the department, and this is just an example of some of the things that. Um, we have uh, outlined in those in terms of roles and responsibilities. So from our partners, we, we ask that, you know, just a lot of the things that you're already doing, uh, park maintenance, water maintenance, uh, establishing and enforcing park rules, uh, those are all things you do right now anyway. Some of the additional things we'd be asking for is we would provide the signs uh, and the posts for you guys to install out there. Um, and uh, we just ask that, you know, usually how we do it is we sort of uh, work together in finding a location that works and then have the, uh, the city put them in. And then we'll come out, uh, provide the signs, uh, we'll put them up, and if the city department wants to put them up, uh, that's fine too. Sometimes the cities prefer to put them up themselves. Um, obviously, allowing the department uh, access uh, so that we can get our stocking vehicles in there uh, when it comes time for stocking. So if there's gates or locks or things of that nature, we often ask for um, access or a key or something like that because oftentimes we may roll in during the middle of the night or 3.30 in the morning, oftentimes when you know some of the parks are closed. So we ask that we just uh, be given consideration for access. Um, you know, providing inf uh, information to the public, basically promoting it, just letting know, you know, folks know that it's out there and available to them so that uh, they can go out in the community close to home and, and participate uh, in fishing. Um, I put a question mark by law enforcement. One of the things, uh, you know, a lot of cities don't have, you know, formal uh, rangers that are commissioned and, and have the authority to, to cite, uh, usually our wildlife officers do, but, uh, we've tried something a little different with like City of Gilbert. They've actually adopted uh, the Game and Fish code into their municipal code, and then the park rangers can cite under municipal code right into a municipal court. And the fines and anything that goes with that goes directly to you guys, you know. So uh, that's not a requirement. That's just, I'm just throwing that out there as a suggestion, you know, that uh, if you have uh, park rangers, uh, not all cities do. Uh, and then uh, the, the partnership fees. We'll obviously in, uh, provide the signage, as I mentioned. Um, we would uh, replace those if they become damaged due to graffiti or, or damage or, or something like that. Stock the fish. We measure the water quality every single time that we go out, and even months that we don't stock, we at least try to get out at least one month of water quality data. Um, we uh, obviously do the license sales. Uh, sometimes we'll go out and do uh, fishing clinics. Um, at the sites, uh, we do angler surveys, we do our own law enforcements, and then if there's issues with water quality, let's say there's an algae bloom or, you know, something going on, uh, we can provide some guidance, you know, in that area too. So, Matt, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. So that's just an example of what the signs look like. Actually, we're in the process of changing our department uh, logo. Uh, so we're, we're going to actually uh, develop some new signs here. So it'll have our department logo uh, at the top there. But on the bottom here, it would say, you know, town of Prescott Valley and then the location, you know, Fane Lake or Yavapai Lake. So what we uh, put in these signs or the kiosk, we usually put a, uh, a bulletin that comes out every couple of weeks. So that would be uh, information that the public would be uh, available to view while they're on site, as well as a stocking schedule. We uh, post the weeks of so that people could know when the, you know, roughly when the next stocking truck is, is coming in. So. Some of the potential issues, none of this is a surprise to you guys since, you know, we've already got Fane and you're doing it. Uh, obviously, with the good comes some of the bad. You know, you're going to get people uh, that are going to discard fishing line and hooks. It's, it's just inevitable sometimes. Um, an increase in use, you know, may translate to more trash at the lake. So there might be, you know, some additional requirements to sort of, you know, keep up with, with trash. Uh, I put public restrooms in there. You've got those, but there might be, you know, some increased use with those. User group uh, value clashes. You know, what I mean by that is, you know, in some areas there's a lot of, you know, uh, some cities, for example, will promote, you know, feeding of the ducks and waterfowl. 
Um, and some, you know, if we're trying to achieve a, a fishing in that uh, situation, uh, you know, there may just be f people that don't like that type of thing, you know. Uh, and then, you know, there's obviously potential for wildlife and waterfowl injuries with discarded line, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, just to, you know, wrap it up here real quick, if, if uh, it's decided to go forward with this, what we would do is we would write what we call an environmental assessment. It's already done for Fane Lake, but I'd have to do that for the Yavapai Lakes. Uh, that process could take, you know, a few weeks. Uh, it's not a big deal, but that's just something that we do internally. Um, and then we'd obviously work with city and city council on uh, getting that agreement approved. Uh, and then we just commence the stocking of fish. And then uh, usually the way I do it is I invoice our partners uh, on an annual basis, usually at the beginning of our fiscal year. So I usually try to send those out a couple, three months in advance just so the cities know it's common and, you know, so that uh, we're asking for the partnership fees. So with that, I hope I didn't uh, take up uh, too much of your evening here and the rest of your agenda, but uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Well, first of all, thanks for coming out and offering this program to the town. I personally feel that it's a great opportunity for the town to, to increase the recreational value of, of both those locations. So thank you guys for doing what you do and, and bringing that opportunity to everybody in the, in the rural areas as well as the metro Phoenix area. The um, only question I have, maybe it's something Brian could answer to, is the, the Game and Fish fiscal year versus the town of Prescott Valley fiscal year. Um, is this budgeted for? Is it going to be a I mean, obviously uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, I believe we're both on the same fiscal calendar of July through June, yep. uh, so we'll be able to coincide well that way. Uh, and then getting the agreement started, uh, we'll just uh, adopt this in our annual budget requests because uh, it will come from our department in doing so. Uh, so we'll ask for that additional funding. As it was alluded to earlier in the conversation, we know our town manager and deputy town manager have uh, vested interest uh, of uh, pursuing this. Uh, and so I don't feel that that's going to be an issue for us at all. As far as the negatives that come with that, that's part of our business. That's our day-to-day -day bread and butter of what we do and who we're all about. So we're very well prepared uh, for those aspects as well too. Brian, do we have uh, guidelines in place that we use at Fane Lake that we could just plug into the uh, urban forest, you have a pie lakes? Uh, in regards to our standard park rules, it is uh, already adopted there uh, at the urban forest location in the Yavapai Lakes. Uh, we'll work in regards to the same rules and regulations that we have um, from a fisheries uh, process. I know we've done some in-house uh, locations and developments for discarding uh, lines. So we'll be able to bring that as well uh, down to the, our new location uh, uh, directed. And so just to be clear, the total cost to the town would be approximately $6,000 a year. That's all of the fees. And then I'm kind of curious, though. You said your hatcheries and your sources are pretty well maxed out, yet you're expanding this program, and, and this seems like a lot of fish. So how do you how do, you do that? We buy them. We're... we're yeah, we're buying them from vendors. Uh, so we have for trout, we've got, uh, we have three different vendors, two of which were in Colorado. One was in the uh, White Mountains uh, of Eastern Arizona, but we're back down to two vendors. Um, and uh, they've been able to supply us uh, for several years with really good quality fish. Um, it hasn't seemed to be a problem. Every time we've asked them for more fish, uh, they've responded uh, very, very well. Matt's done quite a bit of stocking in the Colorado River. I mean, we're talking big poundage uh, orders, and they've been able to come through for us. Um, on, the, on the catfish and sunfish side, all of those come from ponds in Arkansas. And so we've got a, actually, it's not a, it, the guy that we work through is actually a, more of a broker. He actually doesn't have any ponds. So he goes out and negotiates the deals, uh, finds the best deals, and he'll go wherever he has to go to get the fish that we need. And so that's been, you know, the primary uh, uh, driver behind getting more fish. You know, we obviously got to think uh, long term and, and uh, you know, we'll continue to evaluate, um, 
you know, where our fish are going from our hatcheries. And, you know, we're trying to do a better job at really, you know, trying to get them into the right places where, the, you know, the anglers can make the best use of those. Uh, but it's a, it's a complicated, you know, map that we deal with. And the fish that we purchase all goes through the same fish health assessment process that our hatcheries put our fish through. Um, legally, we couldn't import them into Arizona if we, if we didn't have that done. So we're not going to be bringing diseases in. Well, I think this is an excellent opportunity for all of us here because fishing is a dying sport. I mean, I've talked to a lot of dads that take the kids out to fish, and the kids get bored because they're not catching any fish. So, and a lot of them have just kind of quit doing that and more have turned to hunting and such. So I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to bring it back and, and really get this town excited and have, see some, I'm from North Dakota, so in an hour I was in Minnesota catching fish. And, and what, a, what a thrill. So, you know the fish back <gasps> Oh, really? <laughs> so one of the things with Fain Lake in particular is those summer months, it's too warm to stock rainbow trout. And so we're putting in typically one stocking a year. The last couple of years, I've been able to get additional funding, and we've put in more than that. But that's not consistent funding. And even the one stocking a year came out of my AOO. We didn't have money specifically for that. But we tied that in with free fishing day. And so the hope with this is that we'd have regular stockings during those summer months. Um, and when the trout, you know, and we would schedule for September, but water quality is really marginal. And when I say water quality, it's really just temperature yeah. um, in September. And so a lot of times, even though we were on to stock, we weren't able to because we don't want to put trout in and have them die. Right. And so being able to purchase the catfish allows us to provide more consistent fishing year-round at Fane. So. Well, now we know why we're not listed in the community partnership. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but I think this is really a, an outstanding opportunity for Prescott Valley. Um, the price is very inexpensive, and the opportunity down at what we call the, the urban lakes is just we're adjacent to the park. There's a lot of facilities. People are through there. It looks like a perfect opportunity. Um, Fane Lake, we've, we always seem to... We have an expert, actually, in the crowd, but we uh, get a lot of activity down there. And uh, this would put bigger fish. Absolutely. That's probably the way to go, huh? Yeah, bigger. Okay. <laughs> so I think this is excellent. Brian, how do we proceed with this? Would we need a motion from the commission? So I will accept the motion to recommend. Question, really. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the rules on fishing. How much does like a fishing license cost? So we've got a, uh, a community fishing license. We revamped our entire program in 2014, and a part of that was to uh, provide anglers with a 365-day license, and um, we wanted to not complicate the process. If you guys uh, are, 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 you know, routine anglers, we used to have a trout stamp, we'd have a two-pole stamp, and we had a lot of confusion. There was uh, urban fishing waters, there was statewide waters, we had a separate license. So uh, right now, we, we kept an option for people to buy just an urban license. If that's the only places that they want to fish, that's uh, $24. Oh. And that's for in-state or out-of-state residents. So if you got people coming in from uh, out-of-state, um, staying in local hotels to you know visit and and participate in the beautiful outdoors here in the valley, uh, that's another you know uh, a thing that they can do uh, while they're here. So a statewide resident license is 30, 37, uh, and then like a hunting and fish combo license is um, fifty-seven. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, kids um, age 10 to 17 would uh, we uh, changed it to require licenses, but it's a five dollar license, and that's a combination hunt and fish. And I believe you guys have a family license too, don't you? That or did away. that go away? I, I think when we did the license simplification, that went away. But to clarify, thing what with the license simplification, it used to be you had the community license or the general fishing license. The general fishing license is now valid on the community waters, but the community license is only valid on the community waters. Gotcha. So yeah, if that makes people sense. People in Prescott are fishing links in Goldwater, they'll buy the general fishing right. license, and it would be good for Fane yes. also. 
So, and kids under 10 are free. Mom yep. and dad could take the kids for free and just go to the park. Absolutely. Fish. Yep. We have a question from our. Good evening, commissioners. I'm uh, Andy Sinclair, one of the uh, Prescott Valley uh, commissioners for the Art and Culture Commission. A uh, couple comments I'd like to make to support this concept. $6,000 is a bargain for this amount of fish. I used to own a pond myself, but I stocked it with bass, little fingerlings. For about 50 bass or so, I think I was paying something about uh, $200 or so. So if you look at the cost of $6,000 for everything that's involved here, it's a tremendous bargain. Um, one thing about fishing over at Thane and the other lakes in the area, if people are not catching fish or if people are catching fish, they move around to the other lakes. Uh, one thing that takes place with that also is it becomes an economic development issue. If they're not catching fish at Goldwater, uh, or at links, they're gonna come over here. That means their dollars are also coming over to Fane uh, and Prescott Valley. So that's a major issue. One thing about Fane Lake is that some people do not know it's here. Uh, they drive up and down uh, 69, going over to the lakes in uh, Prescott, but there's no signage on 69 that says the lake is here. I've met many people who said, wow, this is a great lake, but we had no idea it was here. We saw someone at McDonald's or Walmart, and they mentioned a lake, so we came over here. So if we could get signage, if you could help get a sign on State Road 69 that says Fane Lake is here, that would make a major difference. Um, one thing also about Fane Lake and the trout, this is the only location in north central Arizona where you could come and fish for trout. You mentioned Payson, you mentioned some of the other communities. Those are surrounding communities a good 50 miles, well over 50 miles away. Uh, so again, looking at it from an economic development uh, perspective and a recreation perspective, that's bringing a lot of people to Prescott Valley. So I wholeheartedly endorse this concept. Uh, the extra stocking, for a guy that fishes every day when he's not working, uh, this is exceptional. So again, I support it. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. And for your time. Andy, you still work at Sportsman Warehouse, right? No, mm -hmm. I had to leave that position. I had to leave that position, and now I work for the state of Arizona down in uh, Phoenix. Oh. So, yeah, it's a killer drive. Uh, so my days off, I'm over at Fane. Awesome. Glad you Thank you. Me. And this also brings us the opportunity to educate with the educational programs mm -hmm. and that. Education getting, actually I remember is, the free fishing days we had, and, yeah. and it was huge turnouts. And that'll be some of our growth moving forward in regards to these programs and activities. Uh, I know you're familiar with uh, the Cops and Bobbers program, so we do some of those same types of things. Uh, so we'll be enhancing our programming and, and those activities too. And And bring up the red herring, I guess, um, the, the erosion problems we have from the Rose Creek branch. Um, obviously, this doesn't incorporate any of that, but would that be a limitation in the future? No, it doesn't, but also keep in mind where those monies came from in support of a lot of that sedimentation control came from these guys. Uh, that was kind of the precursor to some of this stuff. It came from our heritage grant funding. Uh, so some of that supporting and that partnership will also be able to enhance some of those opportunities and awareness uh, with us as a community partner as well. So we'll be able to make some of those improvements uh, to their point as far as, you know, shoreline access, that was part of this process as well. So actually we've done the work before them ahead of time, but we'll be able to, to continue to maintain, sustain, and also be able to grow. And now we're gaining more shoreline uh, just by being down at uh, Yavapai Lakes. Yeah, I don't think we could ask for a better partner as far as wanting to fish and, and what they're gonna do for our community. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I, I see this as nothing but a positive. Exactly. Well, I would make a uh, motion that we uh, approve joining the community fishing program and recommend to the city council that they uh, fund and join this. That would be a five-year commitment, if I'm correct. 
I think this is an excellent program for Prescott Valley, actually for the whole region, because as Andy said, people travel all around, and the way your fee structures are set up, really, it kind of supports that, so. Right, and, and I'll encourage uh, a clause in there that uh, requests lowering the stocking levels at the area, other area lakes. So that's <laughs> the non-community, yes. So. That's, that's a motion. I'll Mission second that motion. Got a second. All in favor of uh, recommending to town council we join the community fishing program? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you guys you, so Thank much. You. Thank you. This is a great opportunity. This is great, yes. Very exciting time. Time to break out the fly rod. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Andy's out there. Every day um, you're here, really, aren't you? <laughs> Have a safe drive back, guys. Uh, thanks for your time very much. That's exciting. Well, thank you, commissioners, for your time and flexibility in your agenda tonight for that. Uh, we'll definitely uh, make your recommendation known to council. Uh, we'll work uh, with these gentlemen and uh, the town council schedule and uh, make those presentations uh, in the upcoming uh, agendas. Very good. Nice. Sooner the better. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Uh, Moving on to our next agenda item. Is extravaganza still on the table, Brian? My apologies, sir. Extravaganza, do you still have an announcement about the Extravaganza Art Festival? Yes, in regards to uh, just the upcoming date, I want to encourage everyone uh, to please add Saturday, March 24th, that is the weekend prior to Easter, uh, to join with us for Extravaganza and the annual Family Arts Festival. I just encourage a placeholder on that date. More data will be coming forward in our next upcoming council or commission meeting. Very good. Moving on, uh, department update. Uh, department updates for you. I wanted to give you a little bit of information in regards to some of our uh, past activities. Uh, ultimately, uh, we had a very successful uh, lighting ceremony here, uh, December Friday, December 1st. Uh, I hope everyone was able to make, uh, make that date or at least come by during the month of December. Our lights are coming down as we speak now to accommodate other activities uh, coming forward in our future months, uh, but had a really tremendous uh, celebration that particular evening. I know our chamber was quite excited in the fact they had 35 floats uh, participating that evening. Uh, we had hundreds of children enjoying uh, picture opportunities with Santa, and we had several hundred votes going on with our annual Create a Tree program that was on display also uh, throughout the month of uh, December into the early months of uh, January. In addition to that, uh, Fane Park hosted the annual Valley of Lights. Uh, our reports are that we had well over 26,000 vehicles uh, travel through uh, the display this year, as well as then also on our strolling evening, we had over 2,600 people uh, gathering on that uh, inaugural event. So we're looking forward to more fun in, the, in our future uh, with that opportunity for uh, strolling. So everyone keep that into considerations. If you weren't able to do it this year, we are bringing that forward uh, into next season and its display. Uh, Quick note on that. Yes, sir. My wife and I worked the 23rd down there, and we had 1,366 cars come through wow. that night. And you know, I've lived in this town quite a while. We saw four people we knew no. out of all that. <laughs> You're kidding. I mean, many, many out-of-state license plates. And, you know, of course, they want to kind of stop and talk and say, hey, you know, and, and we have to try and keep them moving. But a lot of people are like, wow, this is a cool idea. I'm going to take this back to our town. I mean, this is amazing. And, like I say, we saw four people we knew the whole night. Everybody else was from out of town. Well, I think we're kind of used to it, but we took uh, my brother and his wife, who are from Oregon, through and They were quite impressed. And actually, they, they said, you guys really like lights here in Arizona, don't you? Yeah. We quizzed them all. On, on every year, there's a new, try a new feature being added. So every year, some of the ones that said, oh, we were here last year, and I always quiz them, what's the new one this year? And the majority of them knew that the dream catcher was the new one down there. So they're paying attention. Outstanding. Well, that's good news. And now we'll be able to have a conversation in regards to come back when the sun's up 
and be able to hit our lake and enjoy some uh, trout fishing opportunities. Well, and to, to Mr. Sinclair's point earlier too, uh, I think what draws a lot of people to, to Fane Lake during the Valley of Lights is the signage out on the highway. So it'd be nice to, to have some signage permanently go. on the highway to direct people to the Fane That really Fane would Lake. help. Yes, yeah, not to mention the giant soldier that's out that there telling Maybe you, get, get right get in Get that there. year-round yeah. fisher yes. Santa out well, there. And we know oh. we have that one-lighted display of our fishermen, so now maybe we just need to move him out next to the big soldier. I don't know. And so. there you go. <laughs> and he had a question. I, th I think there was a, a, a cultural vote there. Oh, so. okay. Yeah. He was relating that there was traffic backed out all the way out to the nursery from Fane Lake on the night of the 23rd. Because the new buzz was working. Yes. When we asked people how long did it take you to get down there, and they, were, they said about a 45-minute average wait time. Wow. To an hour to get through it. Bad. And I said, well, are you upset it took so long? And they're like, no, we're going to go through it again if we can. Outstanding. Right Outstanding. And, of course, as everyone knows here, but those folks watching may not, it's an entirely free opportunity. Exactly. There is an opportunity to donate, which we highly encourage. That helps offset the, the, uh, the electrical uh, costs, but also helps enhance and maintain yep. uh, that display. So we're able to add new features as well as take care of those that we do have too. So. Comment. Oh, here he is. Sorry, didn't take up the The idea that the uh, drive is free makes a major difference. Down in uh, Phoenix, along uh, 17, there's a display which is actually possibly smaller than what's here, and there is a fee for that. 30 bucks a car. 30 bucks a car. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, wow. and it's smaller. Yeah. So. Great community event here every, every year. Outstanding. Uh, with that, I have a few more items, but they are wrapped up into your agenda tonight, uh, so I will not uh, add anything more to my director's report. I am happy, however, to answer any questions you may have about uh, my departmental or divisional report or any of the other divisions on the department's report as a whole. Brian, I had a quick question on field allocation. You've yes, completed sir. everything. How are we doing? I mean... Are we, do we have enough fields for it to support all the teams? And, um, you know, we have all this new development going on. Are we looking to the future? What, what is happening? Yes. Uh, with as far as development related, of course, we try to really work with those developers in regards to the conceptual planning. Uh, I know you've seen one already in regards to the Santa Fe Loop and uh, uh, Glassford Hill. Uh, location in uh, Granville. Uh, we'll be looking more uh, to looking forward to more plans coming in as it's coming through the Jasper or uh, developments uh, adjacent to that particular property. Uh, there are other additional properties in our current developments as they are. Stone Ridge and Pronghorn have more uh, acreage requirements that we'll be looking at. So we're looking at uh, comparisons in regards to open space versus developed. Uh, parcel uh, access from that standpoint. Uh, so we're always going to be looking at the, um, the neighborhood athletic field developments that can also be offset in, in practice uh, areas. Uh, our major critical area always, as we know, and part of our new, newest development came through in the Bob Edwards Park development, those are lighted fields. Um, and those are highly sought after and are the most uh, desirable locations and the, the most highly used locations uh, on a year-round basis. Uh, we do have uh, growth in regards to requests, new organizations that have come to us uh, seeking to utilize our facilities. Uh, we've acquired two new tournaments uh, this year that have come to us, which is always a desired and sought after and a higher prioritized uh, allocation. Uh, through our uh, field uh, sharing process. So we're going through those processes. Um, and of course, there are um, demands in regards to the user groups and times of the year. So we definitely have to balance those types of things. So it's a very involved process. Uh, we go through those things, trying to make sure that what is being allocated is utilized in the best fashion possible. So when we do allocate a field, it's perhaps just not for a team. It's for multiple teams within an organization. Get out there, use it. Uh, practice is practice, as uh, 
We had a certain NBA player back in the day that liked to tell us about practice. Why are we talking about practice? Well, it's very critical for us and our development and our uh, sports organization. So uh, very, very busy. Uh, our facilities are well utilized. Um, and we try to look at the rotation of those. And we also schedule in preventative maintenance times so we, we can rest those fields as well as be able to overseed them, fertilize them, uh, and then also work cooperatively with those groups so that they understand the impacts that they can have. And in this case, it's a negative impact that they can have uh, based upon how they're utilizing those assets as well, too. Because by doing such, it's going to cause them long-term problems. Uh, this is very much, uh, with the exception of one field, it's a natural environment out there. So when we have, in this case, die-off or burnouts or any of those types of things, it takes a good deal of recovery time to be able to make that work. Uh, we're fully anticipating that Bob Edwards Park is going to help offset uh, some of those impacts, especially because it's a lighted facility as well, too. Uh, so we're going to continue to manage that in the best way that we possibly can. Uh, so that is really what we're looking at there. Um, and then encouraging folks to look at those outlying uh, park locations or neighborhood park locations and utilizing them uh, stronger. Uh, but we also understand that daylight hours and times of the year are impacted in that way. So it comes back to those facilities. Uh, the only future relief coming from that is going to come out of our potentially, potentially, I say, uh, in our sports complex and our sports complex at Agrofria Park. Uh, but that facility will be developed and designed and it will be focusing predominantly af uh, off of and focusing on tournaments, uh, not only from a local but a uh, uh, four corner state as well as a western uh, standpoint of doing those because that's going to be an economically driven uh, developed facility and doing those kinds of things so that's really what we're looking at uh, we've been very fortunate at least in the 10 years that i've been here we've not had to totally reconstruct uh, an athletic field we've actually been able to do a very exceptional job uh, in continue field usage year after year uh, and that's a rare thing and so we're very 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 fortunate we have a very talented crew out there making those things happen yeah they do an excellent job i just as the population grows it just seems like we have the potential of running out of fields uh agrofria the first funding it's been pushed back to what 21 is the first phase uh, and that's going to be triggered by a couple of different things. But yes, at least what our anticipated timeline process would be 2021. And uh, so are the, is there any um, interest in the new developments um, contributing towards that beyond just their regular, uh, you know, they have, I don't remember what the number is per population number of acres yes they ha they have their uh 6.8 acres per thousand yeah, that that's you. their requirement dedicated to park and open space so it's a combination thereof it's not going to be just in a developed park setting um that is what their or that's what the current standard development is if uh that's to change it's going to change on a larger scale it's going to come through uh, the next level or phasing of the general plan, the town's master planning process, if that formula changes or flexes in any way. Um, and then all, we're also going to look need to look at it in a different way because most of our neighborhood parks will not be designed and our standards don't uh, require, nor should they require, athletic field lighting. Uh, for, right. It's a negative impact from those things. So we're going to have to look at other type of park development uh, to be able to offset those needs for lighted fields and doing that. Uh, there is uh, future uh, ideas and planning out there in regards to Antelope Park. That would be our next location for a potential lighted field in doing that. And that is a multi-purpose field. It, it is uh, home to soccer field, as well as then also our Babe Ruth uh, level boys baseball. And then on the other end, it has uh, softball as well too. Uh, so if lighting comes in, it would come in in, in that uh, next level of development. Yeah. Good. Okay. Any other questions from Brian on his, his uh, update? Um, I'm looking at your December report. Yes, sir. Uh, it 
see here that you met with uh, some promoters for a possible music festival. That is correct, um, and it's very tentative right now. Uh, so we're in the process. We're looking at a possible May date, and that would be at Mountain Valley Park down at the amphitheater. I'm also looking in the arts and culture um, section of it. Um, it says something about uh, determine a feasibility of substituting the event for the Battle of the Bands. That is correct as well. Is that um, eliminating the Battle of the Bands? In it would do that, and that ultimately has been an ongoing discussion for probably at least the last four years with all of our community partners that are involved in that. Mm -hmm. And from a historical context as well, Battle of the Bands was actually um, a supported event from the town uh, from the radio stations, and it was actually Battle of the Radio Stations back 20, literally 20 years ago, because this particular event uh, celebrated the 20th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And so when we started strategizing from a long-term perspective with all of our community uh, partners that were involved, that was really kind of the vision what, once we hit our 20th anniversary year that, uh, um, that it would potentially culminate in the Battle of the Bands ending uh, on its 20th anniversary. Mm. Uh, so we really uh, worked on that, and that's where it has taken us today in regards to this uh, tentative discussions in regards to the development and uh, hosting uh, a, a Prescott Valley Music Festival. Mm. Um, so it's uh, right now it's in its discussionary stage. Uh, if we find that it's going to come to that, we'll enter into a uh, development agreement and uh, begin those processes and hopefully look to forward to a, a long-term uh, processes as well as doing those things. Uh, we bring in a lot of new talent, and right. then as it grows, then being able to bring in some national talent as well. Nice. Got standing. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Further questions? Okay. Seeing none, moving on to the chairperson's report. Um, the only thing I have, uh, just for commission knowledge, is last month we had a guest at the end of our meeting speak about the, the bike parks and how he'd like to see one in, in the Prescott Valley area um, and used the Sedona Bike Park as, as an example of what, they've, what they're doing there. I had a chance to visit the Sedona Bike Park um, a few weeks after that meeting um, and what a community asset that is as well for, for people that are into to, BMXing or uh, downhill mountain biking or whatever they have, <clears throat> I'd say it's probably 10 acres or less um, dedicated for what they call their pump track, which is just dirt rollers, I think it was described in, in Mr. Peck's presentation. Um, a dual slalom course, which is a lot of fun. It's about 300 yards long and it just switchbacks down some steep terrain um, and that's set up for future racing. Um, and then they have two trails that they call flow trails, which are pretty much just a single track trail with, with some features to them. So you can, if you have the, the guts to try it, you can jump <laughs> over things or you can ride the line through the middle, which, which, which I did. I don't like my wheels leaving the ground. Um, but point being that was in their big community park in Sedona, um, ball fields around, um, other, other pavilion, I think they had a pavilion there as well for community events. Um, that they just incorporated it into their plan around the park and probably um, used what most people see as unusable ground to ha build this new amenity. And it certainly would fit in to some current locations and possible future locations in the town of Prescott Valley. So it was uh, a neat to see, it was busy. There was probably 30 or 40 people there you know, in the two hours I was there, um, that's all I could, all I could do. Um, but it was a lot of fun just being able to, you know, work on your skills and, and go on those different features and, and, uh, have a short ride, but a very energetic ride as well. So, um, something to keep in mind. I know that, that Mr. Peck's very excited and, and hoping to bring something like that to the town of Prescott Valley in a partnership. So, um, other than that, um, I don't have any other new business on my end. Um, appreciate everybody's support of the community fishing program and getting that in front of council. Um, so if there's any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the tree advisory board business. Um, 
chairperson's report, just, just an update on the 2018 Tree City USA application and the 2018 growth award. Uh, the applications have com been completed and submitted. Um, we should hear back from, from that organization by the end of February. That is a hopeful anticipation that we will. Um, so I'm hoping by our March meeting, I'll be able to bring that announcement, if not sooner, uh, doing those things. Uh, I would like to applaud uh, the Tree Advisory Committee um, for uh, convening, uh, helping give staff some direction, some uh, dialogue there in regards to some planning and continuing our five-year uh, plan that we have for that program. Uh, I think it has proven itself over the course of the last five years that uh, taking on in that endeavor has really given us a very clear path uh, to follow. It has led to several grants. Um, and growth and, and knowledge of our team, which is uh, by chance those two things are coupled uh, this fiscal year uh, with a grant. Uh, matter of fact, we're going to have scheduled up in the month of January uh, some continuing ed uh, programs for staff uh, coming from that. Also, our um, community advisor uh, to the tree committee, uh, Mr. Diller, uh, was also uh, very supportive this year, and he completed his Tree University <laughs> Board credentials, uh, which added to our application this year for recertification. So uh, very appreciative of his efforts. And so now uh, we're going to be working on the remainder of the commission in regards to those um, those uh, upcoming opportunities uh, for uh, certification of all members. <laughs> in doing those types of things. So uh, we're on a good uh, good course, uh, partnership. Um, hopefully we'll have some future exciting announcements in regards to some other partnerships uh, related to uh, urban forest, or uh, Tree City USA urban forestry right here within the town of Prescott Valley. And it might have a little flavor of 40th anniversary celebration coming with it too. Good. Okay, moving on to old business, we'll uh, go to the ice skating update. Yes, I, uh, just as a matter of courtesy, I wanted to remind the commission and our viewing public that our uh, annual ice skating program will conclude on uh, Sunday, January 14th. It's been a very successful season um, in light of the warm weather out there, uh, so we're very happy about that. and. Uh, just uh, if you haven't been able to get on the ice or if you still have that burning passion, you have until Sunday the 14th to, to get on. And I believe on uh, Sunday there are a total of three sessions starting at 1 o'clock. Or is it just, are we down to just the two? My apologies. Uh, so I believe it's 1 to 3 and then 3.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, so those are your opportunities on the uh, final night on the 14th. Otherwise, all dates between now and then are available uh, on the town website. You can download it, look at that calendar, uh, see each one of those timelines that are available to you. If you're interested in prices and those kinds of things, that's also available. And then on each particular day, we encourage everyone, as we have for the last uh, several months, uh, call the skating hotline just in case there's any updates or added new information in regards to opportunities for skating. Thank you. Uh, a New Year's Eve wrap-up. Yes. I saw some familiar faces out as uh, activities were taking place on December 31st, New Year's Eve. Uh, hopefully you were able to come out and enjoy or you saw some fabulous uh, fireworks kicking off the new year. In total, we had somewhere between five and 600 folks out with us uh, going from uh, 7 until 8.30. I wanted to thank our community partners, the Central Arizona Fire and Medical Authority and our very own Prescott Valley Police Department. They came out. Uh, we had s'mores for over 300 folks there, hot cocoa. Uh, we kicked off a bonfire. Our public works department was involved with us in that, as well as the, the fire authority uh, doing those types of things. We had a variety of different games and activities for families, uh, and it was a lot of fun. I was uh, blown away at how long of a line you could have waiting to play hopscotch uh, <laughs> and all kinds of other things that were going on that particular evening. but. 
Talk about a fun, festive environment. Uh, folks just getting together, enjoying their families and the community that was around them, uh, all in anticipation of the fireworks show that went on for about 10, 15 minutes at 830, and then our other uh, celebratory uh, midnight uh, shooting there too. So kudos to our uh, pyrotechnics team that came out and celebrated with us. In doing that, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed themselves in kicking off um, our 40th anniversary celebrations, and we did that with New Year's Eve this year. Very good. Sounds like it was a great time. Definitely. Okay, uh, wrap up a polar bear splash. This yes. Saturday. Uh, I was going to say, I know uh, Commissioner Brinkman was there. Uh, Buzz, I didn't see in your Speedo. I know Commissioner Freyer was there in sure. and, and, uh, doing all of that. So... Uh, this year was fantastic. I know Mother Nature played a, a role in that, but, uh, man, did we have uh, a ton of folks in attendance. Uh, pancakes, those were gone in a flash. Uh, compliments of IHOP. Uh, not only did they have pancakes, they had sausage, they had eggs for us. Uh, it was just amazing in regards to the community support that came forward. Uh, but this year we had 65 bears jump in, a, a record-setting year. Our goal was to hit 40. And, uh, oh, my gosh, uh, let's think about this. 13, 14 years that we've been doing this program, uh, I think we hit 39 or 41 was our best ever. And this year we just knocked it out of the park. Um, and, boy, did we set a whole new bar for us to be able to reach to. Um, but I think a lot of that did come from uh, Mother Nature, but it also came largely in part to our sponsors. Uh, we had huge prizes out there. Matter of fact, each and every single one of the bears uh, was able to walk away with a free oil change as well as then a uh, meal over at uh, Chick-fil-A that's opening up nice. and doing that. Uh, so they came through big time. Uh, the bears also had a chance for prizes that were in the pool. Uh, we had prizes available for our ice cream eating contest. We had a duck race. Um, we had our donut. Yes, a uh, new event this year was our donut eating contest. Um, and then also our annual ice princess um, in doing such. All had prizes, uh, tons of other activities for folks to join in. And it was a very fun and festive environment uh, out there today. So I appreciate everyone coming out, enjoying themselves. We had support from council. Uh, I think three or four council members were in attendance, as well as our own town manager, uh, enjoying the ice cream himself, too. So in doing all that. So a very, very fun year this year at Polar Bear Splash. And thanks to everyone for their support and involvement. It was great seeing. I, I couldn't stay long and missed, missed all the fun, but... Uh due to other commitments, but uh, it was quite the crowd, and I got there just in time for breakfast to, to run out, so. <laughs> so. I'm sorry. Too. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, though. I was, I'm glad the community enjoyed it. Any other questions for Brian on old business items? Okay. Moving on to new business. Uh, the one item that's left is the daddy-daughter date night. It is, and I want to encourage everyone to register for that upcoming event. It is on Saturday, February, oh gosh darn it, 16th, I think it is, uh, Saturday evening, uh, joining with us. But I'm, the reason why I'm telling you all this now, we're already at 50% capacity and the registration just opened uh, for that opportunity. So if you've got a, a young daughter that'd like to get out there and dance the night away and dad and it's dinner and prizes and all kinds of fun, uh, please consider joining up with us. Uh, we had a waiting list last year, so you definitely want to get on uh, top of that and get registered now. So, in How many slots things. are there, Brian? Uh, there's a total for, I believe, it's 60 couples in doing so. So we have uh, 100 space for 120 folks. And then, of course, if you have an additional daughter, we'll, we'll make that little uh, transition there for you, too, in doing those types of things. But uh, it is a very fun and festive environment. We've got a wonderful uh, uh, ballroom uh, scheduled for it, uh, nice dinner, all those kinds of good things. Good. And again, it is supported by contributors coming from throughout our community because uh, our aim and goal is to make sure that each one of our young ladies that it's in attendance that night uh, has a uh, raffle pot prize available to them and then even some lucky dads are available too. 
Thanks. Okay. Moving on. Uh, any other items that need to be brought up to the commission? Any unscheduled public appearances? Andy, you got anything else you want to share with us? Okay. <laughs> Seeing none, <clears throat> our next meeting is Tuesday, February 13th, 6.30, right here in the Prescott Valley Civic Center Auditorium in the library. And with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, Prescott Valley. See you next month.